Chapter 17. The Hollisters on the Stage. All the children rushed up to Holly, who stood gazing into the Christmas tree woods. There in a small clearing were three beautiful deer and two fawns, their backs to the children. They're real live ones, Pete said softly. They're not our stolen reindeer, Holly. The graceful animals stood so still, though, they did indeed look like make-believe deer. Aren't they pretty? Pam whispered. I want them, Sue burst out. The sound of her high-pitched voice startled the animals. Turning their heads, they took a long look at the Hollister children. Then they loped off among the trees and disappeared. At that moment, Mr. Quist appeared. He greeted the Shoreham Hollisters, who in turn introduced Uncle Russ and their cousins. We came for our Christmas tree, Ricky announced. Help yourself, Mr. Quist said, laughing. You know where it is. Ricky was the first to find it. The tag bearing the Hollister's name was still tied to the stately spruce. May I cut it down, please? He begged his uncle. Sure, if you know how. Where's the hatchet, Pete? The older boy went back to the car for it. When he returned, Uncle Russ said, Here, Ricky, let's see what sort of forester you are. Ricky removed his right mitten and grasped the handle firmly. Then chop, chop, he started to cut at the base of the Christmas tree. But he was so eager to cut it down in a hurry that he chopped too fast. Bang! The blunt edge of the hatchet hit his knee. Ouch! the boy cried, dropping the hatchet and hopping around on one leg. Then he picked up the hatchet and handed it to his brother. Here, Pete, he said, you cut the rest. Whack! 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 The chips flew from the base of the tree, and soon Pete cried out, Timber! So everyone would run out of the way as the tree fell. But Uncle Russ and Mr. Quist eased it onto the fluffy snow so none of the branches would be broken. Say, how are we going to tie the tree onto the car? Teddy asked. Mr. Quist said he kept some heavy twine on hand for just such situations. As he went for it, Pete, Teddy, and Uncle Russ swung the tree to the top of the car. It extended way over the back. Crickets, Pete shouted. This is the biggest tree we've ever had. When Mr. Quist returned with the strong hemp twine, Pete and Teddy lashed the tree to the roof, bringing the twine down through the windows and fastening it inside the car. Suddenly, Sue's eyes lighted up. Oh, let's go see Mrs. Quist. She asked us to stop and visit her when we came for our tree. Before the youngsters could dash off, Mr. Quist informed them that his wife had gone Christmas shopping and wouldn't return until supper time. Disappointed, the Hollisters bid Mr. Quist goodbye and climbed into the car. They had gone only a short distance toward Shoreham when Pam said, I wonder why those boys back there were pointing at us. And look, Pete said, the man in the car passing us just pointed too. Something must be wrong, Pam said. Do you think the tree has come loose? Before they had a chance to find out, they heard a loud swoosh, and Jean shouted, the tree fell off. Oh, I hope it's not ruined, said Pam. Uncle Russ had brought the car to a halt. Now everyone piled out to look at the precious Christmas tree, which lay in the road. The boys turned it over, and everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Only two small branches had been broken off. Pete and Pam carried the tree back to the car. This time we'll tie it on tighter, Uncle Russ said, and helped the boys fix the twine more securely. All set, he asked. Let her roll, Ricky cried, and once more they started for Shoreham. How delighted Mrs. Hollister and Aunt Marge were when the children carried the lovely Christmas tree into the house. Where shall we set it up? Pam asked her mother. Mrs. Hollister suggested they put it in one corner of the living room between two large windows. 
Ricky ran to the cellar and returned with a metal base for the spruce. It did not take long for the boys to set the tree up. Let's trim it tonight, Mother, Pete proposed. Smiling, she said, that would take too long, but suppose you put on the strings of lights now. By the time Mr. Hollister arrived, the tree was a mass of blue, red, green, and white candle-shaped bulbs. It looks great, he commented. And tomorrow we're going to put on the angels and everything, Sue told him. But first, I'm going to the school pagnet with Mommy and Aunt March. The others laughed, and Pam said, It's pageant, dear. At school next morning, excitement ran high. All the pupils filed into the auditorium, except the children who were to be in the different skits. The visitors sat in the rear. The curtain rose, and one after another, the classes put on their skits. How everybody clapped when Holly's class acted out scenes from Switzerland. She played the part of Lucy perfectly. When the second graders from Ricky's class depicted the custom of leaving food for the birds on top of a pole, there was a big surprise. Two pet parakeets pecked at the grain and then flew around the auditorium. One lighted on Sue's shoulder. She giggled in delight. Pam's class had a beautiful nativity scene in the Italian custom, with Pam playing the part of the Madonna. This was a great thrill to her family, for she had told no one she had been awarded the part. Pete's skit came last. What clapping and stomping of feet there was. First, a group of children dressed like those in the Netherlands came out and stuffed their wooden shoes with hay and carrots. Then they placed them beside a dish of water on the porch of their house as refreshment for the bishop's horse. When the horse appeared with the bishop on his back and the little Moorish boy running alongside, Sue cried out, That's my brother in the horse's hind legs with white pants on! Everyone in the auditorium howled with laughter, and the horse did a little dance step, nearly toppling his rider. When the curtain was finally lowered, the visitors and the pupils declared it was the finest show the school had ever put on. The Hollisters said goodbye to their teachers, and after wishing them all a Merry Christmas, hurried home to finish trimming the tree. On the way, they stopped to see how Domingo was. He's been as good as gold, Mrs. Morris said. This made the children very happy. Upon reaching home, Pam and Jean carried the boxes of decorations from the storage room and started to open them. We'd better spread newspapers under the tree first, Pam suggested, so we won't get the rug dirty. Pete offered to go for the papers. As he picked up some old copies, the boy noticed that one was from the town of Clariton. Returning to the living room, he spread the papers out on the floor. Teddy, meanwhile, had found a stepladder. Now everything was set for the trimming of the tree. First, we'll put the star on top, Pam said, pulling the lovely tinseled ornament from one of the boxes. She climbed the ladder and reached up to attach the star to the tip top of the tree. At that moment, Holly and Ricky decided to play hide and seek behind the Christmas tree. Holly hid back of the spreading branches and Ricky cried out, I see Holly, one, two, three. The little girl dashed from the hiding place and in doing so bumped the ladder hard. It teetered. Oh, Pam cried. She lost her balance and would have fallen to the floor if Pete had not caught her. Pam climbed the ladder again and the star was finally attached. When she came down, Pete took her place in order to hang some brightly colored balls on the highest branches. The others began draping silver strands of tinsel on the lower limbs. Oh, doesn't the tree look pretty, Jean said. Pete plugged in the lights and the tree shone and sparkled. Mother, Uncle Ross, Aunt Marge, Sue shouted, come and see. How perfectly lovely, Mrs. Hollister exclaimed, hurrying in. Some of the needles had fallen to the newspapers below the tree. As Pete started to gather them up, 
his eye fell upon an advertisement in the Clareton paper. Hey, read this, he exclaimed excitedly. Pam bent down to see what he was pointing at. Wanted, a large sleigh and reindeer for Christmas decoration, 22 Valley Street. Pam, Pete cried, have you still got that clipping you picked up in the cave? Yes. Suddenly, what Pete was thinking dawned on his sister, too. The crumpled ad she had found was not the one Mr. Tash had put in the Shoreham Eagle at all, but a duplicate of the item in the Clareton paper. Oh, Pete, the girl cried, maybe the thieves sold our Santa to these people. She ran to get the torn paper from her jacket pocket. It was the same ad. This is amazing, Uncle Russ remarked. Mrs. Hollister and Aunt Marge nodded. The other children were too surprised to talk. There's just one way to find out if your hunch is right, said Uncle Russ. We'll drive to Clareton at once. All the children insisted upon going and hurried into their coats and caps. At the last instant, Pete dashed upstairs to get the antler tip their friend Dave had found in the cave. It took an hour to reach the outskirts of Clareton. At once, Uncle Russ inquired for Valley Street. Finding it, the children began to watch eagerly. It was too dark to see house numbers, but already people had turned on lights to show up their Christmas decorations. Suddenly, Ricky cried out, There it is! I see it! Far back on the lawn stood a complete Santa Claus outfit, which looked exactly like the ones stolen from the Hollisters. Uncle Russ stopped the car. Pete jumped to the pavement, clutching the piece of reindeer antler. I'll find out in a minute, he called over his shoulder and dashed across the lawn.